Hello students, welcome to today's lesson. We will be studying power under the top under the unit war, peace and world order. Power is very essential when you're studying war, peace and world order because at the end of the day we look at war, peace and even world order. We take apart the, the top the unit name. War is fought majority of the time because of power. Peace again does have an impact on power and world order is determined again by, by power. So it is very essential for us to understand what power is and what power does in the international, in the international system. Now, power is at the base of international relations and you find that for every international relations practitioner, we are always trying to understand power and in fact Joseph Nye argues that Power is like the weather, and everybody depends on the weather, and everybody talks about the weather. But very few people understand the weather. So in the same way, when it comes to power, political leaders and political pundits are always trying to understand what power is. They're always trying to predict the changes in power, and they're always trying to understand the relationships in, in power. But at the same time, you find that power is not something you can fully explain as much as we have very many explanations and conceptualizations of what power is. At the end of the day, Joseph Nye argues that power is like love. You can only experience it rather than just define or, or measure it. So let's go into defining what power is. Now remember, as with any social science concept, there are various definitions of power. So there's no one specific uh, definition that you can actually use to define this particular concept. Now the lexical meaning or the dictionary meaning defines power as the capacity to do things. When you have the capacity to do something, for instance, if you have the capacity to walk, then you have the power to walk. When you graduate, you're going to be told you have the, you've been given the power to read, that is you've been given the capacity to continue reading. So that is the lexicon definition of power. The other definition is the ability to influence or control people's behavior. And so you find that this idea or this um, influence is very, very important because if you look at things like the media and the reason as, and celebrity culture, and the reason as to why they are seen to be quite powerful is because of the influence they have over individuals. We are able to shape how we think, we are able to shape how we dress, we are able to shape how we act because of what the media, because of what the media shows us. And that's why we talk about the agents of socialization, family, um, religion, media, all these institutions and all these people have a sort of influence over us. They influence how we think. For instance, your religion, whatever religion you belong to, influences how you think, influences how you dress, influences how you relate to other people. So it then means that that your religion has power over, over you. D power can also be defined as the extent to which an and a thing or an individual can make someone or something do something that they otherwise will not have done. Sometimes you may decide, you know what, I'm not going to do one, two, three things. Then um, the media or your parents or anything that has influence over you ends up making you that thing, doing that thing that you others will not have done. And that's why we talk about peer pressure, for instance, because you find that with peer pressure, a lot of the times you may have resolved not to do something, but then because of the pressure, and by the way, peer pressure can also happen to adults, it's not just young people, you find that because of that peer pressure, it can end up making you do something that you others will not have done. And so therefore, it means that that thing or that individual or that institution that ends up making you some, do something that others will not have done, then it means it has power over you. If you look at the state system, for instance, um, a lot of states, of course, all states are sovereign, but of course, uh, the, the sovereignty varies. But you find that there are certain powerful states that are able to impose their will on other states and make them do something that the others will not have, will not have done. Particularly, if you look at, for instance, countries that are dependent, financially dependent, on other states. For instance, if you're dependent financially on America, because you are dependent on them, it might tell you that the America can tell that particular country to do something that the others will not have done. And because the, that state is dependent on America, then they will have to do whatever it is America um, wants them to do. You can also look at power in two senses as a, the capability of taking action, which we mentioned a little earlier, and the ability to influence events, which is tied to what Robert Dahl talks about, making someone do something they otherwise would not have done. The other way you can look at power is that you can look at power as the relative power of states 
being most clearly revealed by the outcomes of their interactions. Remember in international relations, states are interacting with one another. And these interactions are based on the power that a country has. So if you're powerful, then going back to one of the definitions, you're able to influence global events. If you're less powerful, a lot of the times it means that you are, you are being influenced. So when it comes to the interaction or the relational aspect of defining power, you find that therefore that interactions are based on power and that's why we talk about you know north south first world second world and third world countries because it is based on the interactions they have with one another because these states are categorized based on the type of power that they have or the the level of power that they have now let's discuss the essence of power it's very important to understand not just what power is how power is defined as but it's also important to understand what is the essence of power what makes power to be to be power? And that's why we're talking about the essence of power. The first thing to appreciate about power is that it is relational. Now, when I talk about relationality of power, it means that the international system, just even from the unit name, war, peace, and world order, that whole idea of order is that it is relational. That is, there's a hierarchy in the international system. That's why we talk about north-south relations. Of course, the countries that are in the north are the power powerful ones, the countries that are in the south are the less powerful ones. So what it means therefore that is that power does not exist in a vacuum. The sun is not the most powerful star on its own. It is powerful because relative to it there are other stars that are less powerful. So therefore you find that the relationality of power exists because power does not exist in a vacuum, but it has to be in relation to something else. And that's why, again, we talk about first world countries such as America, second world countries such as Brazil, and third world countries such as Kenya. The second essence of power is that it is cumulative. You find that the cumulativeness of power is that states are continually seeking to increase their power. They are continually seeking to increase their power through um, having a strong military. They are continually seeking to increase their power by um, increasing making their economy great. They are continually seeking to, to increase their power through making sure that they, have a, uh, that they have stability, political stability. But now the thing with cumulativeness is the fact that it is something that a state has to continually do. At the same time, some states can actually decide to disinvest in their power. And you find that the, the whole idea of disinvesting in their power is that if a state does not continually invest in their power, it means that that the power resources, for instance, if a country does not look at how strong the economy is growing and the economy continues to suffer and they continue not to care what the economy is doing, then it means then that they are disinvesting in their, in their power. And if you look at countries, if you look at the categorization of countries, strong, weak, and failed states. You find that strong states are always investing in their power. And that's why you find countries like America, countries like China, are always continually investing in their, in their power. For weak states, while we are investing in our power and in all these resources that help in our power, at the same time, you find that we are somewhat leaving some things on the wayside. And, that, and because of that, it means then that our power is, is reducing. And now when it comes to fail states because we remember again the definition of a fail state is a state that is either unwilling or unable to cater to its people but more importantly one of the ways to cater to a people or a citizen is to ensure your economy is stable is to ensure your politics is okay and but because the state is unwilling or unable to do that for its people, then it also means that when it comes to power or the power it projects, then it means that their power has also reduced. The other essence of power is that it is renewable. What this means is that it can be lost and you can also gain it back. And one of the ways a country can lose power is by number one, disinvesting. Secondly, you can lose power by going to war. You can lose power by natural disasters. So you find that 
the renewability of power then gives a country hope that they are able to always gain it back. The fourth essence of power is constituent power. When it comes to constituent power, this is a product of the social dynamics of the, of the state. It means then that the state gets its power from the people, that the state is empowered by the people. And that's why we talk about government of the people, for the people, and by the people. Because at the end of the day, the state gets its power and its legitimacy from the people. Because the moment people lose um, legitimacy or they lose trust and they lose confidence in their state, then it means that the, that the state has also lost relative power within itself and also in relation to other, to other states. Just look at what is happening in America, for instance. America is a superpower. But people over the, uh, the last two, three years under the Trump rule have been losing trust and have been losing confidence in the regime. They have also been losing trust over the last two months because of the, the injustices on the black community. And so you find that because of that, in as much as America is the, is the most powerful state, it is a superpower, but you find that the people from whom it gains the power, they are losing trust in it. And so that means that it has also lost power in the international system to a certain degree, although it still remains as the, as the superpower. The, third, the other thing to look at the essence of power is that it is all about perception. And remember then there's this quote that talks about perception is reality. So states are always keen to project power. And that's why, for instance, you find that when we're having these celebrations, Jamuhuri Day, Madaraka Day, you find that we are majority of the states always have a military parade. These military parades are not done for your benefit because you're going to the stadium. A lot of the times they are done to show uh, force, to show that they have the capacity, to show other states and to show outsiders that they have the capacity and they have the strong military. Just look at the military parades that China shows. Uh, look at the military parades that Russia displays. They show, uh, they show might, they show their power. And so you see by virtue of that, they are always continually managing the perceptions through the military. Another way to, to manage the perception is using diplomacy. And what comes when, when it comes to diplomacy, you ensure that, for instance, the president is the diplomat number one. So again, going back to America, you find that the relative power of America has suffered under the rule of Trump because Amer Trump is not looked at favorably. His personal diplomacy has, is, does not do well as compared to previous American, American presidents. And so you find that because of that, it means then that the perception that people have of America has changed because of the person who is the, is the president. Another thing to look at is association. When it comes to association, it's not similar to relational. Um, association means that as a country, you find that you are, even just as an individual, you're told that you are the sum total of your 10 friends or 11 friends. Then the, what, it ha what happens in the international relations is that your ally also determines the type of power you have. So for instance, if your ally is somebody powerful or rather a state that is powerful, then it means that you have power by, by proxy. If your ally is Russia, then a lot of the times you find that you may be on the wrong side of America because Russia and America are not buddies, if I can put it that way. So therefore you find that who a country associates with or is an ally with determines the type of power they have. It also determines the type of adversaries you have because a lot of the times, if, for instance, if Russia is your friend, or rather if Russia is your ally, then it means that you may have just gained a, a not necessarily an enemy but you will have lost an ally in in America so that's what we mean by association then the final one is power as security now when it comes to power as security it means that number one military is very very important and that's why you find that military st states are always investing in the size of their military states are always invent investing in the te military technology but more importantly when you're talking as pow at power as security you know some of those You've seen gates somewhere, um, and outside there's a placard that says Mbwakali or um, hash dog inside. Before you even get into the house, you already know that that compound has a, has a Mbwakali inside. So 
you are very keen when you are approaching that house that that mwakali does not attack you. So in the same way when it comes to power as security, when you are already a powerful state, and remember again going back to perception, when you're already perceived as a powerful state, it gives you a level of security because other states are going and institutions and other non-state actors are going to be very careful when they interact with you. They're going to be very careful when they approach you because they already at the back of their minds, they, they remember that you're a powerful state and you have certain capabilities. And so they are very careful when they are interacting with the power, with that powerful state. So ne let's now look at the types of power. Now, when it comes to the types of power vis-a-vis -vis, um, the unit, war, peace, and world order, it's very important to understand the types of power because you find that, remembering in the previous slide when we were talking about the fact that power is cumulative, that states have to always invest in their power. So depending on the type of power, you find that some states may decide to, re to invest in certain types of power more than, than the other. So the first type of power is hard power. Now, hard power is all about using inducements and and threats that is using carrots and and sticks so you find that this is a very realistic way of looking at power because you're looking at it from a real politic angle that is you're using coercion and coercion is very important in hard power because it means you're able again going back to what you are discussing influence it so not influence when you're talking about you know making people do something that they otherwise will not have done particularly through coercion a lot of it is done because particularly um, the state that is more powerful can force another state to do something that they otherwise will not have done. For instance, it can threaten, it can threaten to uh, intervene in their internal affairs. It can threaten to use their military against them. And that's why we even talk about, for instance, we talk about, for instance, that a country has to be very keen when they are choosing coercion as a way to display their power. Because you see, if you do not have the relative strength behind you to back up your threats it means that your bluff can be can be called so therefore by the time a state use, uses coercion they have to be very aware and they have to have the capacity within them to actually follow through with their with their threats the second thing under hard power is military now here we are talking about war and intervention and you find that states go to war for various reasons but they go to war as a way to show power the second thing intervention states have been known to intervene in other in other countries for instance you have america going into iraq you have america going into afghanistan using military intervention whatever the reasons were and many scholars have tried to explain and many researchers have tried to explain the reason as to why america was going there but at the end of the day you find that them going into Iraq and then going into Afghanistan had an impact on their on their power. The third thing is economic might. When it comes to economic might, you can use either sanctions, which is very uh, one of the things that is used. But a lot of the time, sanctions are used when the state that is being sanctioned does something that they that they are not supposed to do. So, for instance, you find that North Korea, uh, because they were they were they were investing in their nuclear weapons, there there were trade sanctions against them. So the the international system was trying to force them to stop investing in their nuclear in their nuclear power. So they applied trade sanctions. But another thing about economic might is you can use other tactics such as foreign aid because what happens with foreign aid again you're creating the culture of dependency so the aid donor and has power over the aid recipient then the last one um, the other thing rather to look at under type of power and particularly under hard power is that when states you choose to use had power. They do it because they look at this anarchical international system and they realize or rather they conceptualize within themselves that the only way for them to survive and the only way to help themselves is by using hard power in order to survive in the inter anarchical international system. The second type of power is soft power. Now, soft power is the antithesis of hard power. Just even from the wording, without even going into further explanation, one is hard, one is soft. Now, when it comes to soft power, what happens with soft power is that a state uses attraction. A state uses, Joseph Knight talks about um, seduction. So a state uses attraction rather than using coercion. Remember, coercion is what hard power utilizes. Um, so you find that 
soft power is co-optive power. You're trying to bring people closer to you. You're trying to attract and seduce people closer to you. Rather, that's what a state tries to do. And how soft power is achieved is, number one, through the attractiveness of a country's culture. One of the reasons as to why America is very powerful is that its culture is the most attractive. We love their food. We love how they talk. We love their movies. We love their music. We know even more movies, uh, and we've watched m more movies from America than we've watched our own local movies. We are so immersed in American culture, sometimes even more than our own culture. We name our children after American movie actors more than even our own culture. So that goes to show you that the attractiveness of a culture is very, very important. And one of the reasons as to why, for instance, China may not necessarily be able to gain a relative power to America is that in as much as China has been um, investing in the attractiveness of their culture, there's still so much more they have to do in terms of just making it more attractive. Not as many people talk Chinese, but they have been able to set up Confucius Institutes all over the world to attract people to understand Chinese culture, to attract to understand Chinese language, to understand everything that is that is Chinese. The other thing under soft power is that a state's policies must be seen as legitimate in the eyes of others, and that enhances its soft power. Again, if we look at America, when it is selling its policies, when it is selling particularly its foreign policy, when it is selling democracy, it sells it as this beautiful thing. You can't help but just want to, to have it. And so what happens is that for as long as people view a country's policies to be legitimate, then they continue, and particularly their foreign policy, then their soft power continues to grow. But the moment people feel that it is illegitimate, for instance, when America went into Iraq, they suffered a level of illegitimacy because people later realized that the international system later started questioning. First of all, you went against the UN Security Council's advice, and then there was high civilian death, and that's why you find even the, the war in Iraq Iraq ended up being rephrased to invasion of, of Iraq. And so you find that after that, so many countries were very skeptical of America's interventions around the globe because their legitimacy of using intervention as a foreign policy objective started to suffer in the eyes of the international system. Another way of soft power is that it is able it is the ability, rather, to shape the preferences of other people. Preferences in terms of culture, preferences in terms of ideology, preferences in terms of ways of life. Another thing to look at uh, soft power it is, is that it is all about managing perception. And remember when we were discussing the essence of power, we talked about managing perception. And you see when it comes to, to soft power, you have to continually manage your perception. You have to continually manage how other people or other states view you. And that's why you find that, for instance, when Trump talks about making America great again, he's not just talking about America in itself, or rather in terms of the people making America great um, in isolation, but he wants other people to look at America and, and look at America as being a powerful state. After the Cold War, after the end of the Cold War, the power that the USSR had failed, and of, or rather diminished, and now we have Russia as a country on its own, and of course you find that there was a lot of cessation of states. You find that Russia has over time tried to reclaim its lost glory. It has over time tried to manage the perception that people have of it. And so you find then that it has facilitated, it has started also using soft, although it was using soft power during the Cold War, but under USSR, at the end of the Cold War, it has started liaising with more developing nations to sort of change the perception that other countries have of it. The other thing to look at under soft power is that you, it can be arrived at using three assets. This is what Michael Ignatev talks about. Number one, moral authority. By the time people are able to see you as legitimate, by the time you're able to sell your culture to people, they, they must be able to look at you and say that you are grounded in morality, that your foreign policy is grounded in morality, for instance. That's how you find a country like America, and America is one of the best um, case studies of using or how to use soft power. You find that America, when it is intervening or when it is using its foreign policy, it has this Mother Teresa um, type of foreign policy where they always sell it as it is grounded on democracy. And that's why they, they, uh, they look at uh, the entire international system and say that, you know what, I'm the, I'm the 
superpower and I have authority to police other states because my policing other states is, is relies on their moral authority. The second thing is military capacity. I already talked about that a little earlier. But now when it comes to soft power, you find that milita how military capacity acts is this when it, with regard to soft power. Military capacity, or rather uh, military, military capacity, comes in whereby a state intervenes in another country, but does not just intervene for the sake of intervening, but tying back to the moral authority, they do so because they want to, they have some certain higher purpose they want to achieve in that country. Like when the US went into Iraq, they did it because they said that they were trying to install democracy there. So when it comes to using military capacity, again, the military in as much as it is a hard power resource or a hard power asset, at the same time, you have to be able to package it in a way that when it is used, yes, it can be threatening, but at the same time, it can be used as a force for good, and that is where military intervention comes in. Then the third asset is international assistance capability. The West has really invested in foreign aid. The West has really invested in using their money to help the developing nations. But they're not doing it because they love us so much. They're doing it because they know, even in your life, somebody who helps you economically has some sort of influence over you. So they do it because they know that the moment they, they start helping countries, you know, giving them foreign aid to build roads and infrastructure and what have you, then the next time they can, have, uh, they can come up with conditionalities. And they can tell you, for instance, a lot of the West used to give to America, uh, to, to Africa, and they still do. And one of the conditionalities was that you have to have democracy, but more importantly, they have to have they have to have good governance system. And so, what happens with using international assistance capability as an asset is that you're able to influence events in another country, you're able to influence policies, you're able to influence even how people in that country live. However, Joseph Knight argues the power of attraction can turn to repulsion. Go back to what I mentioned a little earlier, that America sells its policies. America sells democracy. But there are times that it has faced hiccups, especially after going into Iraq, where people question the intention of why they went into Iraq. And so you find that, yes, they may have invested in their soft power. Yes, they may have invested um, in trying to, to portray this particular image of the savior and the prefect and the big brother of the world but them going into Iraq meant that and the arrogance that they went with it um, into Iraq meant that their soft power ended up suffering so soft power in as much as you're trying to attract people just like an individual when you become too much of a braggart or when you become too arrogant even if people were already endeared to you it means that you can end up repulsing you can end up repulsing people so you have to be very very careful how you you a state wills its soft power because it can be easily gained or that it is gained very difficultly but it can be easily it can be easily lost now, when it comes to the sources of soft power soft power can be gotten through three ways through culture and this is what we refer to as social capital basically making your culture to be to be attractive and to be able to universalize your culture american culture is almost a universal culture. The second thing is through political values that you should be able the values you with you hold with you the values you you bear you are bearing them within your country and even outside you outside the borders and that's why you find that America for instance is able to sell democracy as a value. And then finally foreign policy. Your foreign policy must be seen as legitimate and that's why when I talked about America losing relative power after it went into Iraq is because its foreign policy of going of intervention um, lost legitimacy and by the after the Iraq invasion its foreign policy of in intervention has actually suffered after that so it, the invasion of, of Iraq was a seminal um, event in putting a hole in the soft power of America. Now Nye argues also that Incorporating soft power is very important. It's a very important strategy in, um, for any country. However, the power, again, lies in the people. 
the people whom you're trying to attract. So you find that the people whom you're trying to attract, which are, again is the foreign states and the foreign individuals, you find that sometimes they can be easily lost. Sometimes they can end up being repulsed by whatever it is you, whatever it is you're putting out there. And so you find that it's a very delicate balance trying to always ensure that people view you in the best of light. It is a very delicate balance for a state to always ensure that you are being perceived uh, perceived in the right way. Then the last type of power is smart power. Now smart power is the combination of hard power and soft power because a state cannot rely only on hard power, on coercion and what have you, and it cannot only rely on soft power, on attraction and everything that comes with soft power. So what happens is that a state must find a balance between the two. It must find um, a balance between using coercion and attraction. It must be able to use coercion, calculation and belief. When it comes to hard power, that's why we're talking about the use of coercion. And then when it comes to soft power, that's why we're talking about calculation and belief. Because at the end of the day, States, if you rely so much on hard power, it means that people will not be attracted to you as a culture. So for instance, look at, at Russia. Russia has really invested in its hard power. Over time, it's trying to invest in its soft power, but relative to its hard power, its soft power is very, 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 very weak. America, on the other hand, has found a balance between the two. It has found a balance between hard power by using coercion, the military, the economy, and soft power, where it has been able to sell us their values their democracy and their principles. So it has been able to strike a balance between the two. Um, however, remember, because we live in an inter anarchic international system, majority of the time states often find themselves relying on hard power as a way to survive in the international system. So let's look at the elements of power. How can a country gain power? And according to Hans Mogendau, these are the things or these factors are the ones or these elements are the ones that add up to how a country gains or loses power. The first one is geography. When it comes to geography, the size of the country matters. Smaller countries tend to be less powerful than bigger countries. Um, the location. You find again countries in Africa relatively as compared to other countries tend to be in, a, in the West tend to be relatively poor. Landlockedness. If you're a landlocked country, it means that you depend on another country. And so therefore, it means that your relative power, again, has reduced. Then the second one is natural resources. When it comes to natural resources, it's important to possess certain natural resources, but it does not end there. You have to have the natural resources, you must have the capacity to extract those natural resources, and you must also have the capacity to process those natural resources. Because you might be having oil, but you do not have the capacity to extract it, and you do not have the capacity to, to process it. Then the next one is industrial capacity, which is tied to natural resources, because when it comes to industrial capacity, is your manufacturing power, not necessarily for natural resources, but just your, in, your, your industrial capacity, because you might not have certain natural resources, but you're able to manufacture them or process them in your, in your country. Then technology also is very important, because it impacts the quality of life. One of the reasons as to why Kenya is at the level that it is, is because we have been able to um, in, um, invest in our technology, and particularly our internet. And that's why even at this point of COVID, you find that people are able to do e-learning and what have you, because the government was able to invest in, in the technology. And technology also has an impact on military, because it means that if you have good technology, it means you can invest in certain weapons, for instance, new nuclear weapons, you can invest in submarines. You do not have to depend on another country to make this military technology for you. Then the next one is the military. When it comes to the military, the preparedness of the military, the size of the military. America and China and Russia have one of the biggest uh, militaries in the world. And also the strategic bases. Do you have bases all over the world? Um, the next one is the economy. Be the economy is very important because at the end of the day, it costs money to run a country. Are you able to fund projects? Are you able to fund your foreign policy? Are you able to give aid? So the economy is very important. Then the population. 
population is important because number one, if you look at countries that have large populations like Nigeria, like India, like China, they tend to be quite powerful. But more important, it's not just the size, but the personality of the people who are there. Are they educated? Are they ambitious? Are they innovative? So the, the, the character of the population in the country is also very important. The national character, what are the values you espouse as a country? You find that a country like... Um, America that values democracy and the country that like America whose national character is valued by that thing that they truly believe in it becomes even easy to sell their values to other to other countries then the next one is nation, national morale now this ties into the population are your people patriotic I personally believe that are Kenyans and pat Africans and more especially Kenyans suffer from a lack of patriotism. Not many of us know of national anthem in Swahili, the entirety of it. Not a lot of us are able to speak in, in Swahili. One day I said I'm going to try and, and teach an entire unit in a topic in Kiswahili. I'm yet to do that. But at the end of the day, you find that the, if you find a country that is so powerful like America and China and Russia, they are proud to be uh, members or they are proud to be citizens of those countries. So you find that the people or the citizens in a country, the morale of the people, if they are, if they are um, patriotic, it does have an effect on the power that that country bears. Then the quality of di diplomacy is very important because at the end of the day, remember when we talked about soft power, diplomacy has to do with negotiation. Right, so you find that the quality of diplomacy has also has an impact on your soft power. It has an impact on your negotiation, a negotiation for economy, for economic purposes, for social purposes, and what have you, and just basically how the country is perceived out there. And then finally, foreign policy is very important. And when it comes to foreign policy, it is the ability of a state to assert itself and to promote its interests in the international system. And that is why, and not just promote it but promote it consistently and so you find that they do so in order to achieve their national interests and so you find that if a, can a country like again like America and China their foreign policy is very powerful they've been able to over time consistently promote their national their foreign policy and because of that it means they have been able to achieve their national interests so therefore foreign policy is very very important and it has to be very deliberate and it has to be tied to your national interest and it has to also be tied to the type of power you want to get at the end of the day as as a state now let's look at the categories of power War, peace, and world order. This bit of world order, the order is there because there is hierarchy in the international system. So it means that there are categories of, of power. So let's look at the categories of power. The first one is a superpower, and of course it's the most, uh, the most powerful. And a superpower has, is a state with a combination of resources sufficient enough to influence events in the international system. Note, not just a resource, but a combination of resources. These resources is what, what we talked about um, a few seconds ago, the elements of national power. So a superpower must have all these elements of national power. So this is what, these are the resources that um, a superpower must, must have. So you find then that's what we talk about in international relations, polarity. So we are currently in a unipolar international system where we have only one superpower. During the Cold War, Era, we were in a bipolar system where we had US and USSR. The second category is a great power. So uh, this is a state that has the ability to exert influence on a global scale. But it is not a superpower. But a superpower is a great power. But a great power is not a superpower. So for instance, America is a superpower and it is also a great power. China is a great power. It is able to exert a lot of influence, but it is not a superpower because it lacks the combination of resources. So the third category is a regional power. Now, a regional power is a state that exercises influence and power within a, a region. So, for instance, who is the hegemon in, America, in, in, in East Africa? The debate has always been, is it Kenya or Ethiopia? In West Africa, which is the regional power there? Of course, it is Nigeria. In the Southern Africa, which is the hegemon? Of course, it is, it is South Africa. So, these are regional powers. Again, if you look at Americas, the continent, America has 
regional power in the continent of Americas. And it is also a great power and it is also a superpower. So these categories of power are not mutually exclusive. It does not mean that because you're a superpower, you cannot be a great power. But of course, if you're in a lower level, a lot of the time it means you cannot get to the next, to, or rather you do not uh, exhibit the characteristics of the next level. And then we have middle powers. Now these ones are influential second tier states that cannot necessarily be described as great powers or small powers, but they do have power and all states have power at the end of the day. So the exact strategic degree of influence as minor, as minor or secondary regional powers. So for instance, Tanzania has, um, is a, I would consider Tanzania to be a middle power because it has influence in East Africa, but I, do, I cannot take it to be a regional power. Because in East Africa, the, the, the tussle is between Kenya and, and Ethiopia. Then the final one is a small power. Now, this is where all the rest of the states actually fall. Because at the end of the day, all states have some form of power. So if they do not fall in either of the first four categories, then they are a small power. So you find that they have the elements of power, but they do not have as much or considerable um, influence as the other states have. Now, national interest is very important when it comes to power. Because at the end of the day, states behave the way they behave because of the interest that they have. And even when they're formulating their domestic policies and their foreign policy, they're doing so at the back of their mind. They're, national, they're trying to achieve their national interest. So you find, therefore, that national interest also includes the welfare Welfare meaning, you know, looking out for your people. Welfare, making sure that people have not just a livelihood, but the quality of life is good. But also material interest, economy-wise, military, and water view. Um, now, when it comes to national interests, states be behave um, as rational egoists. And what this means is that um, they base their actions on rational power calculations. So even when a state in the international system is trying to gain power, they're always doing calculations at the back of their mind. What is going to increase my power? What is going to decrease my power to look out for it? So you find therefore then it means that states have to be very deliberate when they're making decisions. They are going to have to be very deliberate, or not even just when making decisions but also the types of decisions they make they have to be very deliberate by having a um, by have by, by planning they also have to be very deliberate by having a, a grand strategy now Henry Kissinger argues that survival is the immediate goal but coexistence is the tactic at the end of the day power means that countries are competing with one another but at the end of the day, the states realize that they are not islands and they actually need one another. So therefore, to survive, they have to find a way to cooperate with other states. And that's where rational egoism also comes in. They are, they are doing these calculations and realizing that they cannot do it on their own. So because power is relational, they have to figure out a way to interact with other states, still meet their national interests and still gain their relative power. But they realize that they cannot do it on their own. On their own. Hans Mogendau argues that all political phenomenon and policy seeks to keep power, increase power, and demonstrate power. So when a country is defining its national interest, a lot of the times the national interests, be it economic, social, or political, are supposed to keep power they are supposed to increase power and they are supposed to demonstrate power. How do you keep power? Ensuring that you do not lose the power. By ensuring that, for instance, your military is always is always strong. How do you increase power? You can choose to increase the number of military. You can choose to increase the number of weapons and the types of weapons. How do you demonstrate power? You can choose to use the military to go to war or to intervene. That is just to use, for instance, how you can use um, one particular um, resource to seek to keep power, increase power, and to demonstrate power. Now, when it comes to national interest, they can be defined in various mm -hmm. categories, or rather they fall in various categories. The first one is the ideological category. When it comes to the ideological category, it means that a state comes up with policies that support its ideology. So for instance, America 
always ensures that its policies are always democratic in nature. They fall under the, the ideology of democracy. Then there's the moral and legal criteria. Try states, in as much as we live in a state of anarchy, and states at the end of the day will always do whatever it is they want, but majority of the times they try to work within the limits of international law. Then there's the pragmatic criteria. When it comes to the pragmatic criteria, when you're coming up with foreign policy, and this is very realistic in nature, um, foreign pol or rather national interest is very unemotional. You want to achieve one, two, three things, and you have to figure out how you're going to achieve those goals. So states have to make calculated decisions based on reality. They cannot come up with decisions. They cannot make reality. They cannot come up with um, policies, and they cannot base their calculations based on an ideal. So for instance, the corona issue that we are dealing now, the president will make whatever decisions he makes based on the reality of what is going on. He cannot make a decision hoping to wish away corona because corona is here, so he has to deal with the reality on the ground. Then there's a bureaucratic criteria. Now here we're talking about organizational interests. The various ministries, again, if we look at the corona issue. What does the Ministry of Education want? What does the Ministry of Interior want? What does the Ministry of Health want? So you have to put into, uh, you have to put into consideration what all those organizations and bureaucracy want. Then the next one is partisan criteria. Now here you find that the ruling party defines the national interest. If you look at America, they have the Democrat, the two key parties, the Democrats and the Republicans. A lot of the wars fought in America have been fought under a Republican government. And you find that democracy is promoted the most under a Democrat government. So the type of the whichever political party is ruling or whichever political party, yes, a country has grand, a, a grand strategy ultimately. But at the end of the day, the ruling political party is what defines what the interest of the nation is. Uh, the other thing is the racial criteria. Now here, this is both ethnic and racial. When I talk, uh, this is both ethnic and racial. Uh, who is the majority? Who is the minority? You find that a lot of the times policies in majority of the countries tend to favor the majority. And that's why they, we have the Black Lives Matter, um, uh, the Black Lives Matter um, demonstration happening in America because they feel that the policies, the system is not working for them. So you find, therefore, that you have to be very careful as a nation the type of policies that you come up with. For instance, in Kenya, when we had the 2007-2008 the um, election violence, it was a wake-up call to us as Kenyans that whatever policies we come up with have to ensure that we are are looking out for the well-being and the welfare of everybody that not just some people are being are being favored by the policies and that's why you find that even the transition into the 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 next the, the new constitution was necessary because we needed to actually uh, modify uh, we needed to modify our our constitution we needed to bring governance back to the people so that people can feel an element of inclusion and i believe that is what the uh, devolution has been able to achieve people feel closer to the government and they're able to participate and give their contribution and feedback to the to the government then the next one is the class status criteria now here classes uh, the economic and social classes define their interests. If you look at what Marxists talk about, they say that the state is a committee of the elites, that the, the, the decisions that are made by the states, a lot of the times tend to benefit the elites. Now the elites again can also be, when I talk about social, it can also be racial. So you find that a certain race or a certain um, group of people are considered to be elites, but majority of the time the elites tend to fall in the economic category. Then the final one is foreign dependency criteria. Now this is where the donor recipient power relationship operates. If you are dependent on foreign aid, you find that you are always trying to ensure to be in the good books of the donor states. At the same time, the donor state is always trying to influence the type of policies that you have. So that even if you have particular national interests you want to achieve, at the end of the day, a state still finds itself being a, a recipient state that is dependent on the donor, still finds itself being very reactive and responsive to the donor state because they depend on that particular state. And so you find that there is some element of power imbalance between the two states two states, that is the donor states being powerful and the recipient states being um, 
subservient. When it comes to power in the international in international relations, you realize that power is very critical in international relations and like I, I mentioned at some point that the whole idea of international relations is to try to understand what power is what power does what does it look like what does it feel like and in fact uh, Mashema argues that calculations about power lie at the heart of how states view the world so the states look at the world using the lens of power they look at the they look at the international system in terms of how much power they have how much power they want to get how much power other states have um have over them so power is the currency of politics you cannot talk about politics and not talk about power and even remember what hans mogenda was talking about you know it's about keeping power expanding power and gaining and gaining power so Power is the, is the currency of politics, just the same way uh, money is important to economics. You cannot talk of economics and not talk about and not talk about money. In the same way, you cannot talk about politics and not talk about and not talk about power. So, from the realist conceptualization, power is an intrinsic goal of every state. All states are striving to to gain power. But more importantly, even individuals are striving, striving to gain power. We always want to feel good when we, we dominate one another. And that's what uh, really such as Thomas Hobbes talk about. You know, we are always competing to have more power. We are always trying to be greater than the next person. We all, we all want to be bosses and to drive the biggest cars and to have the biggest thing because it means then that we are better or we are more powerful. And it might sound selfish, but according to realists, that is just how human beings are, are wired. We want to dominate and we want to be better than everybody else. Now, it comes again to power and international relations. That's why we talk about real politics. And real politics is a German word that basically looks at power politics. And it's, it talks about the fact that power or rather state behavior is defined by power relations. So you have to look at the, for you to understand why states behave the way they behave, you have to understand what power means to them, what type of power they have, the level of power they have, the resources that bring power to them. Have they lost power before? Are they trying to gain power and how are they going about? How are they going about that? The other thing to look at is balance of power. Now, balance of power is very important, and it does not mean sameness. What it means is that it's the maintenance of the status quo, such that the powerful states want to continue maintaining their power at the top, um, while the, the less powerful states are always trying to gain relative power. So, for instance, America and China. America wants to maintain its position at the, at the top, and you find that countries such as Russia and China are trying to upset, upset the balance of power and to be more powerful than America. So, it's not, it does not mean sameness but it rather means that states are trying to maintain or upset the balance of of power and the balance of power comes uh, because of three things egoistic interest states are very egoistic in nature they are always looking out for themselves the second thing is power calculations and that's why we talked about the elements of national power they have to look at what resources do they have that can help them gain more power what is it they are doing wrong that is making them lose power and then finally is competition when it comes to power and remember the whole idea that power is zero sum my gain is your loss. Your, your gain is my loss. There's never a day that you find that states are going to be contented with the level of power they had. You'd imagine that America, just because it's a superpower, it will retire and say, I'm okay, now I'm the superpower. It does not work like that. At the end of the day, states are continually accumulating power. They're continually wanting to build the power that they have. And they're continually also trying to shape how people perceive them and the power that they, that they have. Um, so we've come to the end of the lesson. I hope you have been able to link what power is to war, peace, and world order. Because at the end of the day, power is a very essential element of international politics. You cannot talk about war and not talk about power. Because a lot of the times wars are fought because of people's uh, states seeking out power. You can and not again talk about peace and not talk about power. Because it means that states are trying to contain themselves to establish to ensure that there is peace in the international system. And finally, you cannot talk about world order without talking about power because at the end of the day, that order and that hierarchy of states is there because there is relative um, differences in terms of the types of power that, uh, that our states have. Thank you and we'll see you next time. These televised lectures supplement our robust online learning going on on our MKU online platform. 
You can view more on our televised lectures via our online platform. We are in a digital era and Mount Kenya University knows this. The following are the steps to follow so as to complete your online application. Download the application form from the website www.mku.ac.ke. Attach copies of your academic certificates and ID. Pay the application fees via M-Pesa pay bill number 270988. Your ID is the account number. 2,000 shillings is the charge for a postgraduate. You can also deposit in the bank accounts provided on the website. Then email all the above to apply at mku.ac.ke.